Just a quick reminder that these weekly devos are streamed every Wednesday at noon over on our Facebook page, so if you want to catch these as they happen and be able to interact in the chat, that is where you can find them, facebook.com slash Orchard Christian Fellowship. Now enjoy this week's devo. Uh, if any of you watched the sermon uh, last week, which I'm not biased, but I thought it was a very well-made, well-performed sermon. Yeah, uh, you, the person you're going to say that every time. The person that recorded the sermon was great, I think. I think, yeah, the recording of the sermon and the person that was just that, that spoke God's word, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, besides that, unbiased opinion, um, the sermon talked about faith, and uh, we actually stopped halfway through Mark six because we said we're going to go through it here. So this Devo is actually going to be like a little bit of a Bible study. So we're going to read, read the scripture. Uh, Jackson and I are going to share some thoughts about the scripture. And then what we would love for you to do is we're going to be watching the chat while we talk. If you have a question or a comment, put it in the chat and then we'll bring it up and talk about it. So we're going to kind of do a little Bible study together. You guys cool with that? I'm not going to wait until you say yes, because I'm just going to (laughs) assume. Yeah. I'm just going to assume that you're saying yes. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with us to Mark chapter 6. We're going to be um we're going to be starting at verse 30. Uh I'm rocking the old school NIV. I found out that my NIV is old. They like made a newer version of the NIV and my mm-hmm. Bible is so just tore up and old that I didn't know there was a newer version. I have to get a new Bible. My wife tells me that I need to order one. I just don't do it. Yeah. I've got the new King James going on. So. NKJV. Love it. That's right. Love it. Do you ever do those sword drills when you were in youth group? Or you had yeah, to like, you yeah, yeah. and you're like, hey, Mark 6, go! And you got to turn. Oh, yeah. We should do that at the end of this. Oh, yeah. We'll do it. We'll do a sword drill at the end for all of you, all of you old school <laughs> youth groupers. Do yeah. a sword drill. Elementary school. Wow. Oh, hey. my gosh. So good. All right. Mark 6. All right. So I will start the reading. I'm going to yeah. read Mark 6. I almost said Mark 6, chapter 30. Um, <laughs> Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. Can we, can we pray? Can I pray for us yes. before we start? All right, I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for us taking a pause in our day just to be around your word. So would you center our hearts and our ears and our minds as to what you have to say to us in your word today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Mark All right, chapter ball. 6, starting in verse 30. Did you just say play ball? I did, because I take my hat off when I pray, and so then when I put it back on, I feel like I'm playing ball. My bad. Awesome. It ruined the devo. I apologize. (laughs) All right. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitudes saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Love it. Thank you so much, Jackson, for reading that. So, yeah, what we're going to do, once again, if you've got something, put it in the chat. We're going to be talking and just discussing the scripture, and then we'll keep our eye on the chat. So if you have a comment or a question, uh, put it in there, and then and then we'll just interrupt ourselves, and we'll, and we'll go ahead and talk through it. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts, Jackson. If we go kind of like section, section by section, um, this is what really, really, st- what, 
what really strikes me first. Um, Jesus makes a point for them to rest. Like, I really, really liked that. When you go to verse 31, uh, because so many people were coming and going, they didn't have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Mm -hmm. Go away from ministry. Go away from the work you're doing so that we can rest. I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. Like, I feel like... I feel like we have to hear take a vacation. <laughs> you know, like we have to hear stop working because our culture is so built around work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about that section? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's so easy for us to just almost become addicted to our work. Mm. And I think it's just important that, you know, every so often, just like the Sabbath had taught, you know, way back when. Mm. No. It's uh, it's still important to keep set aside time for rest. Yeah, absolutely. He made, like God God made one of his 10 commandments. You will rest. Mm-hmm. You you will have a break. He was like making sure that we knew he commanded us to take breaks. And it's so funny cuz they even it seems like they're wrestling with this too because they go to a solitary place, but many who saw them coming, they ran. <laughs> So they like run around a lake and are like, oh, Jesus will be there. His disciples will be there. And they just start sprinting. (laughs) I think that's, I think that's like crazy just to see one, how many people want, want what Jesus has. Like they want it. They want what Jesus has that, 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 that they're willing to run, which also is kind of undignified in this culture and time. You don't really run because it lifts up your, your uh, tunic and it could lead to you like mm-hmm. revealing yourself. So running is kind of a sign of like, not shame, but it's just undignified. It's looked down upon mm-hmm. and people don't care. They're just sprinting, sprinting to him. Um, I feel like the next thing that stuck out to me was Jesus's compassion. Uh, and so remember, all of this is going to be done through the lens of faith. So we're still talking about faith and faith in God, right? So how do you think faith can apply to resting. I feel like you kind of mentioned it a bit with w- with the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, simply put, if you have faith in God, you you have the the uh, I don't know the word, but like the the compa- the movement in place to follow His commandments. So, yeah, you know. Yeah, and. Uh, I feel like I feel like what I what God had been saying to me while while I was going through these passages was faith is not about you, it's about me. And if faith is about believing and following in God, then Jesus in this moment says, "You did what I asked you to do. Now it's time for you to rest. Come with me and rest." And it's I kind of hate this passage because it's like Jesus says that, and I wish he would have. I wish he would have went to the, went to the people. It was like, hey, I really appreciate you, but we're not going to do it today. We're going to rest today. Today, <laughs> today the church is off. The church is off on Mondays, so I'm sorry you can't, <laughs> you can't come see us. We're not going to talk. But of course, that's not what happens. And so it seems like the next thing is this idea of compassion. Like sometimes ministry does get in the way, and I think I think the difference maybe is. It doesn't seem like there's an obligation or or there's like a uh, like somebody else to do ministry to because that can lead to burnout. What we see is it says Jesus has compassion on them, right? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So then he began to teach them. So it was this idea of moving in the spirit with the heart. Like if God is going to take away some of your rest, he's going to equip you to do that. And he's the one that's going to be drawing you. Like, like there's a difference between doing something cause you have to do it and doing something because you're compassionate. Right. Once again, we really want to know what you guys think. So put some thoughts, put some thoughts and questions in the chat for us. So this is not the first time he feeds a couple thousand people. Which is more than 5,000 because they did not count women and children. We know that contextually. So um, what would you do if you were a disciple? (laughs) And he said, you give them something to eat. (laughs) Like, what would your thought be? I would be like, Jesus, there are 5,000 people here. (laughs) And that doesn't even count 
There's only 5,000 men here. That yeah. doesn't even count the women and children. How am I going to feed all these people? We got five <laughs> loaves of bread. We got two fish. I know two of us are, more than two of us are fishermen, but, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love how, um, I love how snarky they're being with Jesus. When I, when I, uh, sermon prepped for this, I was, I was looking in the ESV and the way the ESV says verse uh, 37, where it says, but he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages in the, uh, uh, in the ESV. It says that would take 200 denarii and 200, 200 denarii is 200 days wages. So let's just recognize that the disciples are being sarcastic with the king of kings and the lord of lords <laughs> like they're like jesus we can't feed these people idiot did they call <laughs> jesus and it like did that happen we don't know we don't know but like just for a moment let's just recognize how personal jesus is like he's so personal that we learned previously that his hometown can't even accept him because he was too human right uh, but he's sarcastic, he's funny, he's provoking, he's friendly, compassionate. Like, he cares about his people, and he wants to get them rest. Like, this is the relationship that Jesus has with his disciples. That he he gives them power, he gives them authority, he teaches them, he calls them to go to a place of rest, and then he tries to feed everyone. Like Like, this is the relationship that God has with his disciples, and this is the relationship that God wants to have with you. Our God is such a personal God. Mm -hmm. He is so incredibly personal. Mm -hmm. It just like, it causes me just to pause when you're like reading through scripture to see how incredibly personal Jesus was. That he would look at us running to see him and he would just be willing to give up his free time. Like that's... That's a lot of love. There's not a lot of people mm-hmm. in our lives that I don't do that. I wrestle <laughs> with uh, giving up my free time. Yeah. I really, really wrestle with it. Jesus, he'll freely give it. Like he's he is he is so incredibly personal. Um, I read this in um in a commentary on this section, and he said, um, "Faith expects God to provide." So provision, God providing, is actually a truth about God. It's a part of his character. I would love some of your thoughts on this. It, it, we notice this in the Psalms, that God is always providing. When you like read through the Psalms, they constantly talk about the provision of God, provision of God, provision of God. And so this idea during the feeding of the 5,000, when Jesus is saying, you give them something to eat, and then he blesses the food, and multitudes come back, it's the idea of in God's economy, there's always a surplus. God, as his character, is mm-hmm. a provider. He will always provide. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the next section. Let's do it. All right. So we are at verse 45. I'm going to read until the end and then we'll have a couple more thoughts and then we'll end up doing pretty good today. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. So I like that he kind of rectifies the idea of rest because he knows that they need rest, so he sends them 
He sends them on the boat, and then he goes off by himself to pray. Um, this this makes me laugh so much. Um, in verse 48, <laughs> Jesus is walking on water, and he sees them straining against the oars, and then he walks on the lake, and it says he was about to pass by them. <laughs> like, yeah. God, he, was, he was just going to... I'll see you there. And just, and just <laughs> go. He was not even going to get in the boat. He was going to just walk past them to the shore. But then he had compassion for them. <laughs> he did. And so he was like, yeah, yeah. Probably Ooh, they're kind of struggling. I might, get in, <laughs> I might get in that boat. <laughs> but it just, it just makes me laugh. Like, was he so focused on the, on the, uh, on the mission that he, like, had to, he, he was, like, just, we have to get to the other side, so so I'm just going to go. Was he competitive? Was he like, I want to race this boat? He was like, this boat's <laughs> going to be way too slow. He just, <laughs> just, I got to get there. <laughs> Wendy! All right, what'd you ask? What lesson were they supposed to learn from the loaves, and why not the loaves and fish? Yes! Okay, cool. So this is a really good point. I um, I was I was reading I was reading this as well, um, and I had that question because it said, it was so intriguing that like, he walks on the water, he gets into them, and uh, it says that they were completely amazed, but then it like stops. You figured they would say they were completely amazed and then and then go to like the other gospels that say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him, right? But they say that later when he calms another storm, right? Because he's sleeping mm-hmm. on, a, on a pillow, his head's on a pillow. I love that. I love that comment. Like the dude had my pillow and he was just laying there sleeping but anyways um but then it said where is it i gotta find it for they had not understood about the loaves their hearts were hardened i was reading a commentary wendy oh you just had this in your devos on monday sweet We, we would love to know if there's anything special or new that you learned from that that would be helpful for anybody else here one of the commentaries that i read about that said that this is actually hope in being wrong. The one thing that we know about the disciples, they don't understand what God's doing. They don't, they don't understand some of these miracles, some of these things that Jesus is doing and things that he's saying, right? We just had a couple chapters back where he has to explain the parables to them. So he's telling parables so that only his people will kind of really get it, the ones that are tapped in, and the ones that are tapped in aren't getting it. <laughs> He's like, all right, well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to explain this to you. One of the things they mention here is what they didn't get was kind of the comment that we made about how God in his character is a provider. And so based off of our faith in God, we should expect him to provide. Now, one of the real life struggles with that is we don't know. We don't know how. We don't know when, right? But what we know is that God is a provider. And so the wrestling is, well, if we don't have enough food, should we just pray and give thanks to God and break loaves? I think... I think in a way the answer to that is yes. The answer is be thankful for the things that you have. Give thanks to God for it and expect him to provide because he is a he is a provider. We mm-hmm. in reading this passage and reading these passages, we always have the benefit of hindsight. And hindsight's 2020, 20, right? That's the little that's the phrase, right? So looking back, we kind of see and go, "Well, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they know that he was Jesus?" Well, because other people had done some pretty crazy stuff. There had been numerous people claiming to be the next Messiah, and all of them were murdered. And so even when Jesus gets murdered, you have to give them a little bit of grace because they're like, oh, dang, like maybe this guy wasn't, maybe he was, you know, we don't know. So they know there's something different about Jesus, but they're still wrestling with it. And the commentator made the point about these disciples struggling in belief and their hearts being being hardened and he said the real the real intriguing point about this is we should be so thankful (laughs) that hardened hearted people were chosen as the disciples of christ Mm -hmm. it once again goes to the point that faith is not about us it is all about god the mere fact that it has nothing to do with us 
Like these men, they really wrestled with Jesus as the Christ, yet they were chosen, they were anointed, and they began a revolution that changed and is still changing the world. These were people that struggled. These were people that wrestled. And God chose them and God stayed with them. And that was not a requirement. You don't have to be 100% in your faith. It goes back to the passage in Matthew. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, it's not in terms of the results. It's in terms of your belief. Even if you wrestle, wrestle with God, you can still have faith in him. Like, how wonderful is that? How wonderful is it to have a God that says, it's okay if you have doubts. I don't care if you have doubts. I can do amazing work if you have doubts. I'm still going to be with you. I'm still going to get in the boat. I'm still going to calm the storm. Even when you don't understand, even if your heart is hard in a certain area, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll take care of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, what a, what, a, what a hope that is for all of us that wrestle and struggle and deal with the accuser that says, you're not a Christian. I saw you do that. You know that you have doubts about this. You know that you wrestle with it. Terry Grant, we expect to be provided for in our way, but God provides what is best for us. Yes, yes, very true, very true. It's um, kind of like one of the things of sometimes God gives you what you want, sometimes he gives you what you need, sometimes he gives you both. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. um, a perfect example. My wife and I are uh, still praying for my truck. I've entered another truck giveaway. I do it every time. I do it every time. And I pray to the Lord. I said, Lord, I know you can provide this. I know you can give it to me. I know you can do it. But it's okay if it doesn't happen. I want it to happen. But it's not a, if, it, if my faith was based off of God giving me a truck, then my faith would not be in Jesus, Right. It wouldn't be in Jesus. Whether he gives that to me or not, it doesn't matter. It's not going to affect my faith in Jesus, right? Tell you what, well, that'll be next week's Devo if I win that truck. <laughs> next week's Devo, nothing to do with God. Let's talk about my truck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's just, that was, I'm actually really glad you asked that because that, cause that's what we were what uh we were giving yeah (laughs) give me the truck or take away the uh desire my heart is hard in my desire for the truck there's no (laughs) taking away in all reality what i'm really praying for is god can you give me a truck because i'm going to make my wife spend money to buy one so it would just be really great if we got one for free it's really a prayer um for megan so let's go ahead and end here. We're um, getting really close slash over some, some, some of our time, and, and we want to honor honor your time together. Um, so we kind of end just with the sheer power of God, uh, the idea that he, um, he is so powerful in person that if people could touch the hem of his garment, the fringe, they'd be healed. Like, Power is dripping off of this man, right? Um, the moment I read this, it was an immediate pull to uh, Peter. I believe it's Peter. I don't. It 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 could have been Paul as well. But but the apostles and how even walking in their shadow, there was a sense of healing, right? The idea of speaking and there being healing. There is power in God, and when you see the disciples have this in Acts. What it says for us is that as a disciple, we believe that God has chosen us because we can do what he does. Mm -hmm. And now one of the big wrestles that we can have with that is how exactly, how exactly does that, does that plan out? Does that mean that we have the power for healing? Does that have the does that mean that we have the gifts of prophecy, da, 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 going back to all the gifts of the Spirit? And there's different schools of Christian thought that kind of like settle on that. But I think at the end of the day, the question is not how, because once again, that goes back to the results. The question is who. Being a disciple means a couple of things. This is the take home today, okay? Being a disciple means you're chosen by God. Jesus chose you. He chose you. He went to you, entered your heart. He chose you. That's first. You follow Christ. That's what you do. And all of that is rooted in love. Because when he chose you, he also died for you. Right? That's where that came from. 
And then we learn and we do what he does. We are Christ's ambassadors sent into the world. Living in faith is living like Christ. There's a fascinating verse in the uh, uh, New Testament. The, the reference just skipped my mind, but the verse says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our life from now until we meet him in person is living like him in this world. Being the light and the, and, and, and the spirit that he, that was in him being in us. That is what we do. And the requirement for that, the, the only requirement for being a disciple is faith. Not in our ability, but in his. No matter how small that faith is, our faith is in the person of Jesus Christ, not in the results of our actions. You are a disciple. You are chosen by God. You follow him. You learn from him. And you do what he does. The only requirement is faith in him. That's it.